Hello and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Half the World, Claudia Jones. In 1955, Claudia Jones was deported from the United States of America. When an interviewer asked her why, she offered an explanation that sums her up so perfectly that we may as well quote it at length. As a black woman communist of West Indian descent, I was a thorn in their side in my opposition to Jim Crow racist discrimination against 16 million black Americans in the United States, in my work for redress of these grievances, for unity of black and white workers, for women's rights and my general political activity, urging the American people to help by their struggles to change the present foreign and domestic policy of the United States. I was deported and refused an opportunity to complete my American citizenship because I fought for peace against the huge arms budget which funds should be directed to improving the social needs of the people. I was deported because I urged the prosecution of lynchers rather than prosecution of communists and other democratic Americans who opposed the lynchers and big financiers and warmongers, the real advocates of force and violence in the USA. No less eloquent was a speech she had given to a judge in 1953, just before being sentenced to a year's imprisonment. Rather than begging for mercy, she proudly proclaimed her communism. She also pointed out that by running roughshod over her freedoms, the court was unwittingly fulfilling a prophecy made by Karl Marx himself, the time would come when the powers that be would no longer live by the very laws they themselves have fashioned. The irony was not lost on other Africana thinkers either. With the memory of World War II still recent, Langston Hughes issued a stark warning. Hitler had begun by locking up communists and moved on to Jews. And in America, the Negroes are number two on history's list. If communists are sent to jail, in a little while they will send Negroes to jail, simply for being Negroes, and to concentration camps just for being colored. Alarmist, perhaps, but it was, after all, an alarming time. Like Paul Robeson, W.E.B. Du Bois, and others, Jones was persecuted during the Red Scare of the 1950s. She was arrested several times and served nine months in prison before being deported. Where Robeson and Du Bois were prevented from leaving the United States, cutting someone like Robeson off from his international career, as an artist and activist, the Trinidadian Jones never succeeded in gaining U.S. citizenship, and so was exiled from the country where she had been since just before her ninth birthday. She settled in England, where her activism as a communist continued unabated, and perhaps even reached new heights. Despite health problems that would end her life in 1964, at only 49 years old, she continued to travel, write, and organize. Already before her deportation, she had joined a pioneering activist group in the United States, called, in tribute to the star of a previous podcast episode, the Sojourners for Truth and Justice. She went on to found a committee of Afro-Asian and Caribbean organizations. She wrote a column for the Daily Worker, pointedly titled Half the World, in reference to the female half of the human race. And in 1958, she founded the West Indian Gazette. Her leadership of this journal brought her into contact with many other characters from our story. Amy Ashwood Garvey was a friend and collaborator, Robeson did benefit concerts for the Gazette, and it published interviews with W.E.B. Du Bois and Martin Luther King Jr. One of its journalists, Donald Hines, tells of how the cash-strapped operation could barely afford printing costs. Nonetheless, Jones found the money to send Hines to a youth festival in Vienna sponsored by the Soviet Union where he got to see Robeson sing Old Man River on the banks of the Danube. Much later, Heinz recalled, it dawned on me that this was part of Claudia's plan to educate me. Heinz was certainly not alone in being an object of her educational zeal. Her writings are devoted to political agitation and polemic, certainly, but also to the task of expounding, explaining, and expanding upon the rationale underlying the communist cause. Even her defiant speech to the judge has the tone of a didactic lecture about why the entire process is a farce. The accusations against her were based primarily on her writings, 
which supposedly ran afoul of the Smith Act, an anti-communist law criminalizing activities and speech aimed at overthrowing the United States government. Jones told the judge that she and her co-defendants had not pursued that aim. And for all her radicalism, this plea of innocence is actually pretty convincing. A letter by Jones published in the Daily Worker in 1950 had stated, We are Americans, each and every one of us, similarly persecuted, not by accident of birth, but by choice. We yield to no one in laying claim to being true patriots. Then in 1951, she had written of fighting to squeeze out every concession right here under capitalism relative to fighting women's numerous disabilities and inequalities in the home, on the job, in the community. Even if she dreamed of turning America into a socialist utopia, she understood that incremental change was a more realistic target. Perhaps this is why an FBI report about Jones admitted that it was difficult to find smoking gun evidence to justify her persecution. It is felt that a much stronger case exists than is presented. If, like the FBI, we insist on seeking insurrectionary sentiments in Jones's writings from this era, they might most plausibly be found in a piece from 1946 called On the Right to Self-Determination for the Negro People in the Black Belt. Here, Jones makes points familiar to us from our look at earlier African-American socialists, for instance that the white working class would benefit from making common cause with their black brothers and sisters in the exploited class. In a passage that evokes the earlier idea that blacks constitute a nation within a nation, Jones cites Lenin for the idea that black Americans are an oppressed nation. As the title of the essay says, her recommended remedy to this situation is self-determination, which for her would include the political right to separate from the oppressive political structure. So Jones would seem to be positioning herself against integration, a true heir of Marcus Garvey. And perhaps if you squint hard enough through a haze of paranoia, the essay might look like a challenge to the legitimacy of the US government. But this would be to overlook the nuances within her argument. She says that practical conditions need to be right for separation to make sense, and that these conditions are not present in 1950s America. Self-determination is thus more like a guiding principle or programmatic demand, as she puts it. Again, her idea is incremental change towards what could ultimately be a very different future. Jones was, of course, like other Africana Marxists in seeking to situate black liberation within the cause of class liberation. But this was only half of her overall strategy. She also sought to forge links between black liberation and women's liberation. As we know, as far back as the 19th century, there had been occasional tension between these two movements. You might remember figures as early as Frederick Douglass weighing up the question of whether the fight for racial or gender equality should be considered to have priority. As usual, Jones took a clear stance on that question. Much as we've seen other authors arguing that black activism could be the leading edge of a broader socialist effort, she wrote that the Negro question in the United States is prior to, and not equal to, the women question. Thus anyone interested in women's equality should set their minds to racial equality. Jones brought together all three factors, class, race, and gender, in what may be her most celebrated essay, An End to the Neglect of the Problems of Negro Women. It was published in 1949, as one of several pieces she contributed to the periodical Political Affairs. Here, she forcefully articulates an idea we've seen being made by earlier Africana feminists, namely that Black women face multiple kinds of simultaneous, mutually exacerbating forms of mistreatment. Jones, unlike some of those previous feminists, puts special emphasis on the plight of working-class Black women. She refers to the combination of oppressions they face as the dilemma of being triply oppressed, or as super-exploitation. To illustrate the latter term, she adduces the sort of statistic that has, since her time, become depressingly familiar, that on average women earn less than men and black people less than white people, with the predictable result being that black women earn less than other demographic groups. As a communist, she is focused not so much on the plight of black women in general as on those black women who are also victims of capitalist exploitation. Thus, she expresses her observation about multiple kinds of oppression by saying that, the economic, political, and social demands of Negro women are not just ordinary demands, but special demands flowing from special discrimination, 
facing Negro women as women, as workers, and as Negroes. For her, this phenomenon was personal as well as political. She told of how her family moved with great optimism to America from Trinidad, only to find that the American dream was not for them. Her mother died young of meningitis, something Jones traced to a life of punishing labor in a non-unionized garment shop. Jones was, of course, a strong proponent of unionization and made a complaint that would remain no less relevant today than it was in 1949, namely that domestic workers are not unionized and thus have little or no protection from exploitation and abuse. The precarious position of black women in the home is particularly galling, given their essential role in preserving the integrity of social structures among African Americans. She says, Historically, the Negro woman has been the guardian, the protector of the Negro family, something she traces to the time of slavery when marriage was nearly unknown and children were necessarily bonded to their mothers and not their fathers. Notice that she is here making the same historical observation that was repeatedly emphasized by E. Franklin Frazier, but with a far more positive attitude towards what he called matriarchy. Unlike Frazier, she traces the phenomenon of powerful mothers to traditional African cultures, rather than seeing it as a new and unfortunate byproduct of the slave trade. To make this point, she cites stories of self-sacrifice among West African women, such as those who offered themselves to slave traders to secure the freedom of their children. We suspect that Jones would have found much of interest in episodes 22 and 23 of this podcast series about gender in pre-colonial African culture. Like other Africana socialists of this period, including Robeson, Du Bois, and C.L.R. James, she was international in her outlook. Her biographer, Carol Boyce Davies, notes that, while this was true throughout Jones's career, a more global perspective came especially to the fore after Jones moved to England. Boyce Davies writes, Ironically, deportation and London provided the opportunity for the kind of distancing that would allow her to develop a fuller Pan-Africanist and Caribbean community orientation. Jones's expanding sense of her own identity is epitomized by the title of her aforementioned periodical, The West Indian Gazette, especially once that title was expanded to West Indian Gazette and Afro-Asian Caribbean News. Perhaps most noteworthy was a cultural project organized and promoted by Jones through the Gazette, the Caribbean Carnival held in London in 1959. This is what evolved into the Notting Hill Carnival, a massive parade and street party that is known to be one of the most important Caribbean carnivals outside of the Caribbean. It would be hard to deny that this annual event, enjoyed by many millions over the years, remains the most lasting and influential of her contributions to the world. One might worry, though, that such merriment seems rather frivolous in comparison to her sharp political commentary. The triumph of workers over the ruling class is presumably not often on the minds of those who attend Notting Hill, dancing to the sounds of soca, showing off elaborate costumes, and, in general, having a good time. Jones, however, would vigorously reject the attempt to separate this aspect of her legacy from the rest of her thought and activism. She titled one reflection on the event, A People's Art is the Genesis of Their Freedom. She reflects in the piece on the struggle of West Indians to make Britain home, especially in the face of violent attacks like the murder of Kelso Cochrane, an Antiguan carpenter and aspiring lawyer, stabbed to death in Notting Hill in May of 1959. Racist evil of this sort constituted the backdrop against which the Notting Hill Carnival affirmed the beauty of Caribbean identity. Jones's reflection even makes intriguing connections between art, politics, and science by referring to the space race as another part of the event's backdrop. She then writes, our multiracial culture should be the fount helping the universal quest to turn the instruments of science everywhere for the good of all mankind, for the freedom of all the world's peoples, no matter what the pigment of their skin. We noted in our last episode that the late 1950s and early 1960s saw the rise and fall of a quest to unite most of the British colonized Caribbean into a powerful federation. In a 1958 essay called British Imperialism and the West Indies, Jones strongly endorses West Indian Federation, apparently in line with her earlier idea of self-determination. Her four-point plan, envisioning what the Federation might achieve, calls for self-government by the islands, the protection of civil liberties, the shielding of minority rights, and national independence. 
This would be a way of defying the defied and rule strategy of imperialist nations. She had already issued warnings about this in America, where white workers were pitted against black workers by the cunning of the bourgeoisie. In this case, though, Jones is not interested only in the working class. She emphasizes here that what unites the all-class struggle of the West Indian people is opposition to foreign imperialism. In light of such proposals, we might expect to find Jones supporting the so-called non-aligned movement, in which nations refuse to choose sides between the USA and Soviet Union. Some leading Africana thinkers did just that in the 1950s and the 1960s, for example, Kwame Nkrumah. But in fact, Claudia Jones had picked a side a long time ago. Despite her protestations that she was an American patriot, that side was the Soviet one. Given that she was a communist, it's not surprising to see her quoting Lenin with approval. Still, some may find it shocking to come across passages where she praises Joseph Stalin, as when she celebrates his enlightened view that women are the most oppressed of all the oppressed. That oppression is mercifully absent in the USSR, where in Jones's estimation, full enjoyment of equal rights by women is guaranteed by the very nature of the socialist society in which class divisions and human exploitation are abolished. She also echoed Paul Robeson's positive remarks about the lack of racism in Soviet society, where there is no national or racial oppression, people of all nationalities, all colors, live as free and equal peoples. In short, the Soviet Union is a beacon of light, hope, and truth for darker peoples. Jones had an opportunity to put her enthusiasm to the test when she traveled to Yalta in 1962. This inspired a laudatory poem and a piece in the Gazette about the fantastic life enjoyed by Soviet subjects. She explained her motivation for the visit as follows. I wanted to see for myself the first land of socialism, to meet its people, to see for myself the growth of its society, its culture, its technological and scientific advance. I was curious to see a land which I already knew abhorred racial discrimination to the extent of making it a legal crime, and where the equality of all people is a recognized axiom. Here, we should bear in mind that not all socialists, Africana or otherwise, of this period were so admiring of the USSR, especially under Stalin. As we just saw recently, C.L.R. James condemned Stalinism as a perversion of the original socialist project of Lenin's revolution. Should we then condemn Jones for naivete or blind devotion to the socialist cause? Well, there's no doubt that she was an apologist who at times bent over backwards to praise whatever could be praised and avoided criticizing what deserved to be criticized. But she was no wide-eyed optimist. Rather, the reverse. She was horrified by capitalist imperialism, which in her eyes had long proved itself to be the real threat to the peoples of Africa and its diaspora, as well as other places like Southeast Asia. If she spoke out in favor of communist states, it was because she saw them as the one necessary counterweight that could oppose that imperialism. If we bear this in mind, we can make sense of what may otherwise seem to be fluctuating and inconsistent positions on the subject of warfare. Generally speaking, Jones was a pacifist. In 1940, she published a piece arguing against American involvement in World War II. Its satirical bite is well conveyed by the title, Jim Crow in Uniform, and a reference to Herbert Hoover as chief egg in the scramble for Finnish relief. She reminds her black readership of the mistreatment of black American soldiers in World War I and asks why it should go any better this time around. But by 1942, she's producing an essay called Lift Every Voice for Victory. Using the example of Joe Lewis, the famous black boxer who had signed up to fight, she exhorted that same readership to go out and beat Hitler and Hirohito. For the most part, this piece is straightforward war propaganda. Yet at one revealing moment, she writes, yes, there are things wrong with America, with reference to its discrimination and lynchings. Still, the choice between American democracy and outright fascism is an easy one. As we can see from this, Jones was a polemicist who put her rhetorical firepower at the service of whichever power seemed most likely to promote peace and freedom. In 1942, that appeared to be the United States. But in the 1950s and 1960s, it was whoever was in a position to stand against the United States. Which is how this long-standing pacifist came to celebrate China's explosion of an atom bomb in 1964. 
Her treatment of communist China was much like her treatment of the Soviet Union. She visited the country, pronounced herself delighted, and wrote a poem full of praise, in this case, Yenan, Cradle of the Revolution. She also occasionally published texts from the Chinese Communist Party in the Gazette. When China successfully detonated the bomb, Jones wrote in its pages that this event was an important contribution to the struggle against bellicose and aggressive imperialism for the safeguarding of world peace. A recent study of this episode by Zi Feng Yu concedes that Jones's portrait of China was romanticized, if not entirely counterfactual. But in a way, it was also grounded in hard-headed, even cynical realism. Global peace was still the goal, but it would be possible only once imperialism and colonialism were stopped. For this reason, she equated peaceful forces with the communist group. And there's another more subtle aspect of what may look like simple propaganda produced by Jones in the years leading up to her death. She did not praise all aspects of Chinese and Soviet leadership or society, but selectively chose those aspects that aligned with her own priorities. As we saw, she cited Stalin with approval, but not necessarily because she wanted to praise him as a leader in general. Rather, she gives him points for understanding, or at least pretending to understand, that women suffer from a special form of oppression. In this, Jones may be compared to another woman Africana thinker who was active in the middle of the 20th century, one with a familiar name, Shirley Graham Du Bois. She was the second wife of W.E.B. Du Bois and married him in 1951 when he was already 83 years old. By this time, she had an impressive writing career behind her, having written for the stage and served as secretary for the NAACP. Her experiences during the Cold War were not unlike those of Jones. Graham Du Bois was targeted by the U.S. authorities when a commission that included Spiro Agnew and Ronald Reagan refused her a visa to do a speaking tour of American colleges in 1970. She wrote in defense of left-wing causes and of pan-Africanist leaders like Kwame Nkrumah and Gamal Abdel Nasser. In a study of her writings around this time, Von Raspberry raises a worry similar to the one we've been considering with respect to Jones, namely that Graham Du Bois was an uncritical apologist for socialism. Her polemics often seem doctrinaire. The West is unambiguously, even villainously imperialist. The Soviet Union is a friend of the darker races and super agent of peace. But Raspberry argues that Graham Du Bois carefully tailored her arguments to promote her own political agenda her own vision for the anti-imperialist struggle. He writes, Graham's partisanship performs an affirmative, ostensibly hagiographic role in relation to the state. It also works to massage official doctrines in accordance with her own geopolitical vision. These words would apply just as well to Claudia Jones, whose philosophy and political agenda is captured nicely by the epitaph on her gravestone in Highgate Cemetery in London, valiant fighter against racism and imperialism who dedicated her life to the progress of socialism and the liberation of her own black people. In a bit of landscape planning that is almost too good to be true, Jones's burial place is positioned just to the left of the grave of another socialist, Karl Marx himself. Showing a flair for titles that would serve her well if she ever got into podcasting, the aforementioned Carol Boyce Davies thus called her book about Jones Left of Karl Marx, she does, however, miss the opportunity to point out that Claudia Jones thereby managed to join Marx himself in a communist plot. Professor Bryce Davies will be joining us as an interview guest next time to tell us more about this remarkable figure and her intellectual context, so you'd be doing yourself a grave disservice if you missed the next episode of The History of Africana Philosophy. <laughs>